So my name is Saudi. I am a facilitator for InCulture Company. And um, I have the pleasure of being here with Dr. Christina Cecilia Davidson. Um, and I'll let her introduce herself, but the topic of today's conversation is going to be evangelical Christianity in the Dominican Republic. And we're gonna cover the origins of evangelical Christianity. We're gonna cover everything from to contemporary present day engagements with the politics and the cultural politics of it. So I'll let Dr. Davidson introduce herself uh, and we'll take it from there. Hi everyone, I am Christina Cecilia Davidson. I am a postdoctoral fellow at the Charles Warren Center for Studies in American History at Harvard University. Um, I finished my PhD at Duke University uh, where I wrote a dissertation on the African Methodist Episcopal Church and its history in Santo Domingo. Um, and currently I am writing that into a book and uh, thinking about a next book project um, on the AME Church and Latin America. So um, I'm really happy and pleased to be here today. And thank you, Sa Saudi, uh, for the interview. So a lot of folks have been commenting on some of the posts that we put online um, this past week through the InCulture Company um, Instagram page. And what we were highlighting were examples of the interactions between evangelical church in contemporary Dominican Republic and Haiti um, and just the parishioners, the people who are participating and engaged in the church. And there were a lot of questions and comments about, you know, how how is evangelical Christianity impacting um, Dominican and Haitian life today? So we want to start with a question about the origins, right, of evangelical Christianity in the country. So uh, Dr. Davidson, can you provide us with a brief historical overview of the even, um, evangelical Christianity in the DR and Haiti? Right. So uh, what we know as kind of modern um, evangelical Christianity or Protestantism as opposed to Catholicism, um, typically people will cite the immigration of African Americans to Haiti and Dominican Republic or Hispaniola in the 1820s during the period of unification uh, between Haiti and Dominican Republic. And so that's the moment when you have large uh, groups of Protestants actually settling on this on uh, the territory. Um, and from there you'll have you have uh, various uh, evangelical missionaries uh, represented by the British, uh, the British Wesleyan um, Society, um, also African Americans, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, along with immigrants, uh, sent a couple of preachers uh, to proselytize to the communities, as well as uh, preach to the immigrants themselves. Um, the period in which I study uh, deals with the late 19th century. And during that period, um, what I argue in my research is that you actually have uh, the first time when in Santo Domingo, uh, there are missionaries, Protestant missionaries who establish a Protestant church and that is in the capital of the Dominican Republic. Um, and so to me, that marks a new uh, era of um, evangelical activity on the island, uh, because it's also a moment uh, going into the 1890s and the early 1900s when the international community, uh, North Atlantic international community, so here I'm thinking about mostly Britain and the United States, are becoming increasingly concerned about proselytizing to all of Latin America um, and in the Caribbean. And so along with that, particularly after 1910, um, there's a larger push to bring evangelical Christianity, uh, Protestantism to the Dominican Republic. And we see that uh, especially with the establishment of the Iglesia Evangelica Dominicana, the Dominican Evangelical Church, um, in 1921 during the first U.S. occupation of the country. So that really marks a separate uh, era of evangelical Christianity. Now what happens? Um, beginning in the 1940s, uh, you have the first uh, long-term establishment of Pentecostalism, which is a form of Protestantism um, that was really developed um, in the early 20th century, but doesn't 
There was an initial minister who arrived in San Pedro Macaris in 1917, but it doesn't really get its start in uh, the Dominican Republic until the 1940s, when you have American missionaries, again, uh, bringing in um, uh, missions, bringing in programming under uh, the cover of the Assemblies of God um, and a few other historical Protestant churches. And then you fast forward to the end of the Trujillo dictatorship, um, and there's another moment uh, where, where Pentecostals are gaining more influence during the 1960s. Um, but it's not until really the end of the 1980s and the 1990s that Pentecostalism really explodes on the island. Um, and then in these last two to three decades, uh, there's also been an explosion of neo-Pentecostal groups that are not tied to the, um, the original uh, big, big Pentecostal um, denominations like the Assemblies of God. And so that's a broad, <laughs> in broad strokes, the different kinds of periodizations of uh, evangelicalism on uh, the Eastern side of Hispaniola, Dominican Republic. Wow, okay. So I'm just like writing a bit of a comment to, to digest some of that, because what it seems to me that you're sort of pointing out is that the relationship between religion culture, militarization, and also empire um, is clear, right? Um, the idea around the 1910s was really like U.S. influencing the hemisphere, saying we're going to, what was the word, the, the phrases that were used, like we're going to speak softly, we're going to carry a big stick, right? I think right. part of that speaking softly is was also having a cultural policy around religion and um, you know, sending out people into the world to do this work right. in the U.S. And it's actually quite explicit, uh, their um, imperialist goals. Uh, for example, in 1911, uh, two missionaries, American missionaries who were um, operating formerly in, in Puerto Rico, um, traveled to the Dominican Republic and they write up a, a report uh, that's called the occupancy of uh, U.S. evangelical forces in Santo Domingo. And so even right there in the title, um, the and I believe I'm, I'm a little bit paraphrasing it, but definitely the occupancy of evangelicalism in Santo Domingo. And so you can see the direct ties between the U.S. occupation and what evangelicals, and these are particularly white American evangelicals, are thinking about uh, doing on the island. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And like, did you ever, like, cause I, cause you're like a fantastic historian. You really like, you got your receipts. Like, <laughs> I think you want to say, we got our receipts. Like we got all this data, you know, we like to know where this information is coming from. So like, you know, it seems to me like you've really done some intense research. And so do you, have you ever come across any pieces like historical archival pieces about the kind of interactions that were unfolding um, between these missionaries um, and folks just, you know, experiencing daily life, you know, even, you know, pre-occupation, post-occupation, during the occupation, have you ever come across anything that made you like, kind of like stop and like take a second look? Mm -hmm. Well, definitely uh, that particular report uh, by missionaries Doreen Huffman uh, stands out. Um, there are, uh, a number of missionaries who go to the island in this 1880 to you know, 1910s period um, that write back intense reports. But the thing that I've actually found to be most interesting um, in my research, well, one of the things that I find to be really interesting are what Dominicans themselves are saying and what Puerto Ricans are saying. Because when uh, the ecumenical movement takes place. And what I mean by ecumenical is actually what takes place in during the occupation is that three um, American denominations join together and create a missionary church. They create the um, Dominican Evangelical Church. Um, in doing so, uh, they try to partner with uh, Puerto Ricans and uh, fund them to come into the islands. And so in Puerto Rico, there's actually a newspaper um, that where missionaries are writing about their ex own experiences um, on the island. And that's fascinating. Um, and then they start a newspaper in the Dominican Republic and that's fascinating. And so 
to me, um, understanding how people are thinking about religion, how they're thinking about society, um, how they're thinking about their interactions um, and, and what what God is leading them to do in terms of infrastructure, right, around uh, education uh, of people, health. The first hospital, uh, major hospital, international hospital in Santo Domingo is created by this evangelical group. Um, to me, that that is quite fascinating in terms of their vision, right? Uh, very much tied to U.S. empire, but also um, a soft empire, right? Hmm. So interesting. So we actually have a question from an audience member. Um, Veronica Chetling asked, "What was this just in the Dominican side or on the entire island? Yes. Um, so I my, my expertise is actually on the Dominican side. Um, however, what I do know is that Haiti looks a little bit differently during this period. Um, the ecumenical group that uh, I study did not create a mission uh, to Haiti. Um, however, in the 1940s, the Pentecostal groups do go to Haiti around the same period. And so I cannot speak quite as much um, around the occupation, the US occupation of Haiti. Um, I do know that there's a lot more research that needs to be done on missionaries writ large uh, in both the Dominican Republic and Haiti. Um, and so we do know about earlier missionaries in Haiti. We know about uh, James Theodore Holly, who was an African-American missionary there um, in the 1860s, uh, 70s and 80s. Um, we know about uh, the AME church that also went there. Um, but there really does need to be a lot more. And also I would, should say the British, the British Wesleyan church, which established a circuit between Haiti and the DR. So all of the Northern regions, Cape Haitian, um, Monte Cristi, um, Puerto Plata, Samana, these are all connected, um, ports, not just through economy, but also, uh, through missionary organizations. So I'm typing these names so that folks can have direct access and like do their own research. So what was the name of the, um, you said it was, um, was it an African-American person who was in Haiti doing missionary work? Yes, uh, James Theodore Holly. Holly, mm -hmm. H-O-L-L-Y. He was there with the Episcopal Church. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's quite a bit of, of research on him. So. Um, there's an excellent book uh, that, um, I'm going to, of course, forget the name, uh, but uh, we can post it afterwards, um, that basically details his life. Um, outside of him, however, there, there are a few secondary sources. There are a number of primary sources. Okay, awesome. Mm -hmm. This is already super enlightening um, mm -hmm. because... Also, I, I personally tend to think about the missionary work. I mean, religion is not my expertise. I think it, I tend to think about the missionary work as only performed by white Americans. But from what our conversation is sounding like, there were other folks from like Puerto Rico or African Americans, African American folks, yes. um, who also like partook in this. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just necessarily, you know, white evangelicals. Although like the values of like Christianity, you know how do I say it, like the values oftentimes aligned with like, the interests of U.S. empire and white supremacy. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that I think are is a myth when we think about missionaries, right? We think about it um, as only white Americans uh, from the outside imposing religion. Um, however, there are a number of of different kinds of people, right? African Americans, you mentioned Puerto Ricans, you mentioned who um, also had their own visions and partnered with them with white American resources, and sometimes not. Sometimes uh, white Americans would not, right? Partner with uh, with uh, people of color in evangelizing the island because they thought of. And this is I, I just published a paper on um, this particular topic, but there was a very racialized way in which um, North Atlantic people, right, white British and white Americans thought about Latin America. And one of the things that took place in the, uh, the 
late 19th century, early 20th century was a deliberate attempt to uh, separate out black preachers from white preachers, right? And really bring in Puerto Rican and white American preachers, um, even though uh, black African American preachers, the few of them existed. And when I say few, I mean three, right? <laughs> three or four um, in the in the South, Eastern regions of the country when they're proselytizing in places like San Pedro Macariz and um, Santo Domingo, they actually are preaching in Spanish and English, right? So they are preaching to mixed congregations and when it mixed meaning mixed lingually and ethnically. Um, and so they're, um, the idea is that that will not do. <laughs> Right from and, and and to really drive in these these barriers, right? And a lot of that has to do with how missions are funded in that particular period, right? Early twentieth century. That's really fascinating because there is historical data. There's folks like Michael Wright who has written about the U.S. occupation and the treatment of women uh, and the policing of Black women during the U.S. occupation, as well as the work of Lorena Garcia Peña who has written about the policing of um, folks in the southwest of the DR, San Juan de la Maguana, um, and the sort of like violence committed against these Afro-Dominican religious communities um, during the occupation. And so it's interesting to like see these like racial schemas that are really foreign to the island as a whole um, really be applied on it through the avenue of religion, which is, mm -hmm. you know, fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, I agree. Um, sure. Let's move on into another question. Um, so one of the questions that we had is that, that you developed like a new model for thinking about the history of evangelical Christianity. And I want us to highlight like why that's important, what you sort of come up with. Right. So one of the ways that people think about Christianity, right, uh, I would say on the whole island um, is they'll think about the Catholic church and then you think about the Pentecostals, right? Uh, which in the Dominican Republic, um, people typically think, oh, Christian, right? A Christian, right? And that typically refers to all of evangelicals, um, whether they are from a historical evangelical tradition. And by historical, I mean Methodist, Baptist, um, Anglican, uh, Lutheran, right, um, or a Pentecostal group, which, as we know, um, come a little bit later. Um, and so all of those are kind of lumped together within an evangelical culture. What I think is really important and in, in what my model points out um, is just what I outlined at the very beginning, that actually we should talk about not just a single origin moment uh, for in a continuum, right, um, but actually different periods in which Protestant Christianity um, surfaces, right, and has different, so multiple origin points. So we can think about the 1820s as one origin point. We can think about the late 19th century as another, um, and then the 1960s, or 40s, excuse me, and then the later period. And what that allows us to do is actually tease out some of what you um, were talking about, uh, Saladi, the, the multi-ethnicity of the different kinds of missionaries, um, the various projects in which they were engaged, the reasons that they went down to the island, and not uh, just think about it as a uh, evangelical continuum, right? I think that's really important because um, African Americans' goals for the island were not the same as white Americans, and neither were uh, the goals and thoughts of the Puerto Ricans who came over in the 1920s, um, exactly the same as those of African-Americans who emigrated in the 1820s, right? And so we have to think about these moments uh, distinctly um, and think about, I think, um, think about how each of them have contributed to what it is that we have today. That's really interesting. Um, thank you for highlighting that. Um, and also like the diversity of people who have felt like the island was a place that they could go and do this kind of work. So I guess that's, it's a sort of like question for me, like why come here? Like I know there are many places that missionaries have gone to, 
But right. it seems like from the very, like since the 1820s, there has been that desire and that influence. So like what has attracted people to the Dominican Republic in Haiti right. to do this kind of work? So if we're talking about the 1820s, that's referring specifically to African-Americans, right? And the, the visions that they have of the island. Uh, the island of Hispaniola has always, within the African-American imaginary, held a particularly special symbolic place because of the Haitian Revolution um, and because it became the first Black Republic, right? And so this place and this site of freedom, um, African-Americans not only based their hopes in that, uh, but they saw it as a divine intervention in a worldwide system of oppression, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, Haiti, for African Americans, is the symbol of hope, and it's not just African Americans in this uh, early nineteenth century period, but it's people across the Atlantic world, right? Um, and so, why the Dominican Republic? Well, the Dominican Republic gets wrapped up into that symbol of hope um, for a number of reasons, right? Um, one, because of the unification period, right? So at one point uh, for, for two, a little bit more than two decades, um, the Dominican Republic uh, and, and Haiti are one, right? And so African-Americans, when they're thinking about Haiti, they're thinking about the Dominican Republic too. And that sort of lumping them together as one doesn't just stop in 1844, <laughs> right? Even, um, even and uh, historian Ann Eller talks about this, on, on the Dominican side of the island, there are groups of people who aren't even sure if, if separation is going to last, right? Some people even argue to get back together, right? Um, and so if you fast forward to the War of Restoration, which is exactly what Ann Eller's work is on, um, you see that people are interpreting this as a race war, right? So these legacies of how, what the island symbolizes and what it means for, um, for race relations, uh, not just on Hispaniola, but in the Americas, right? Um, and in the Atlantic world writ large, it becomes a larger, a larger uh, symbolic space. And so when African-Americans go there um, after the Civil War and after the War of Restoration, they're going with the intent of converting people of color, right? They're going with the intent that they're going to uplift the black race. And this same sort of uh, intentions of uplift, the same racial uplift is the same rhetoric that African Americans are using when they go from the North to the South to educate newly freed uh, slaves, right, in the South after the Civil War. It's the same rhetoric that they use when uh, thousands of them get on boats and go over to Liberia, right? And it's the same rhetoric that they use when they start missions in Port-au-Prince and in Santo Domingo. Mm, that's so interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm such a history nerd. And like, I love <laughs> the 19th century because of these like quirky things that were happening that the 20th century Dominican project really erases, right? The yes. Ancianismo project completely erases these um, joint histories and like the yes. desires and hopes that people had that were really kind of wrapped up together. Mm -hmm. you know? And mm -hmm. I feel like I love hearing it from, from a historian who's really studied this period to say like, here's the evidence of the ways in which it wasn't just the people of the island who felt this way, but this joining of these sort of missions to be free black people really attracted people from all over the Atlantic. Right, right, exactly. And of course, right, they come with their own um, set of ideals <laughs> and own uh, stereotypes about people who are not Protestant, who are not Anglophone, right? And so you get a, a, a certainly a, an American chauvinism, but it's a particular form of African American chauvinism um, that, in some ways, you know, there are strains of that that still exist today. And so when we think about the African diaspora, I think it's really important to um, highlight the solidarity, but also the places of friction, right? Um, where um, people have not always respected the culture of others. 
Yeah, so on this related topic, Veronica Chatelian again asked, um, I'm interested in what you meant by the white missionaries' goals were not the same as those of African-American missionaries. Both groups still travel to Hispaniola with the intent of spreading evangelism and changing the religious landscape to Western lens. What elements of their practices are so different from each other? It's a really good question. Yeah, so what I meant was that their racial outlook was different, right? The ways that they thought about the people were different. And certainly, as I just said, um, there was, um, there was definitely American chauvinism, right, displayed by African Americans who go there in uh, the late 19th century. Um, but when we're, we're actually talking about two very different groups of people with different histories, um, both originating in the United States, both um, even originating within historical churches, and we, we might be able to say uh, most strongly the Methodist church in the United States. But the African Methodists who end up in Santo Domingo are there, um, they come from a history of uh, social protest against racism um, mm. and against slavery. And so when they go to Santo Domingo, they're going there with the project of racial uplift, um, thinking about the people, of course, with their own sets of biases, but thinking about the people more or less as equals, right? Mm. When white Americans go um, decades later, right, in the US occupation period, uh, first of all, they're going with a lot of means. They actually have a good deal of money behind them. They're going with a social program um, to change, to impact uh, the health, right? So they start a hospital to impact education um, and to also do uh, missions, right? Uh, basically change uh, the religious culture. Um, and th they have the capacity to do that uh, with their ties. And these are what I don't mean formal ties, they're informal ties to U the US uh, government, right? The military government um, or Marines government. Um, and so their intent is different, right? The way, what I mean is their intent, of course, is to convert the people, but the ways that they go about it is different and how they think about them people themselves is different. Um, and so I think that that's important to keep separate, right? Um, there, are, in, in talking with people to, uh, uh, in San Domingo, I've often um, had people say, well, you know, the Amy church was a small church, you know, um, it's insignificant, or um, they didn't try to convert Dominicans. And that's not necessarily true. Uh, it is true that it's a small church. They did not have um, they did not have the same sort of monetary resources, um, but it's definitely not true that they were. Um, it was not true that they that they that they weren't thinking about Dominicans, right, and how to convert them as well, right. I hope that that cleared that up a little bit. Yeah. No. I think it. I think it did. I think it. It was for me. It was pretty clear, but. Um, if there are any questions, it's awesome to hear what you all are thinking and to have your questions just kind of like liven up the conversation and like help clarify any points. You know, we're really digging into like a pretty deep history of evangelical Christianity. Um, and so I would love to sort of pivot to this like post 1980s period. Um, I recently saw The Family on Netflix. Um, I don't know how many of the viewers have seen that show, but it's essentially like a four part mini series about um, the rise and, and the political ascendancy of evangelical Christianity in the US uh, and the ways that they were have been able to really influence the political culture um, where now, you know, the evangelical Christian vote is like a significant portion of the constituency that supported Donald Trump. Um, and so I'm really interested in um, just sort of digging into this like post Reagan, post 1980s period of evangelical Christianity. Dr. Davison, I know you recently um, did a report on this, uh, on this very topic. Um, so I really wanna know a little bit about what does this post 1980s period look like? Right, so um, 
as we know, uh, <laughs> Pentecostalism has exploded, right, in the Dominican Republic. Um, now, estimates are about 25% um, of the country identifies as uh, Pentecostal or evangelical Christian on some level. Um, and that has had uh, a broad-based change, right, um, effect on society. Um, and so that began really in the 1990s, um, the 1990 election uh, with Jose Francisco Peña Gomez. He's the, he was the first to really kind of target um, evangelical Christians as uh, a voting bloc, um, as well as uh, since then, uh, they have had larger representation uh, within government. Um, ha they've had greater access to media, um, civil society actually takes uh, the evangelical church into account um, when developing plans and programs aimed at improving, right, the public and personal quality of life for Dominicans. Um, and we could also say that they've had meaningful presence in uh, on radio, um, in, in all forms of media, um, internet sites, um, of course, TV, television, uh, libraries. Uh, now we have the uh, National Evangelical University, uh, which, which was really just uh, formed within the last decade. Um, and so all of these things are making it possible for uh, evangelical Christians uh, to really influence um, Dominican society at multiple levels. And so um, I think, does that answer the question? I, I forgot where we were going with this. Yeah, I think I think it really does. Like I think that um yeah, I, I was just I was really curious about the ways in which they have been able to um more or less um really begin to shift the culture and like I see it, right? Like I see it here mm -hmm. in the country, like the radio stations that are playing on the buses are evangelical radio stations mm -hmm. which like their message is one of uplift of it like you know you can't mm -hmm. succeed in life you can make it you know uh, i was driving from the Cibao down to the capital and i passed by the evangelical um university actually mm -hmm. you see it right it's very prominent you see it right mm -hmm. off the road um and so you know i'd be i'd be really curious to understand a little bit more about like how they've been able to sort of move into political spaces in a very, very Catholic society. Right. You know, the Dominican Republic is an incredibly Catholic society. Yeah. So what have been the avenues to gain political power in this context? So I think some of the avenues that I just mentioned um, are, are some of the primary ways that evangelical Christians have gotten their message out. Um, and of course, there are churches, right, <laughs> which is another way. Um, but one of the things that my colleague, uh, Brenda Jamal Thornton at UNC has argued in a recent book is that Dominican culture itself is intensely Christian, right? Um, and that we, have, we can see um, throughout the history, the pairing between or the close relationship between the Catholic Church um, and the Dominican government, which of course has impacted Dominican culture, right? And so what his argument, and one of the things that he argues is that the reason, one of the reasons why evangelical Christianity um, has really grabbed a hold of society or has been able to spread, right? Is because people, we're not, ju we're not just talking about a conversion, right? A complete 180. We're talking about a, po a, a space in which there's actually a religious politics, right? <laughs> going on um, and where evangelical Christianity represents, yes, a break from uh, certain uh, ways of being, certain cultural ways of being within the Dominican Republic, but also one that is uh, legible. It is culturally legible because there's already a Christian base, right? A, a, a religious slash spiritual understanding. And so people who are Catholic, people who are evangelical, and people who uh, practice various forms of, uh, of Dominican voodoo or popular Catholicism are all operating within a spiritual space in which the language, and what I mean, the metaphorical language of this spiritual space is the same. 
right? Whether you call them santos or you call them demons, right? It's still, it makes sense, right? And so his basic argument is that um, evangelical Christianity has been able to use that base, basic understanding within society to bring a new message and people have really caught on to that, right? Hmm. So what's this new message? I mean, I'm so not religious, so I can't even begin to tell you. So what, what is this new message that's being shared? What would you say it is? Well, some of the basic uh, tenets um, or differences, I would say, between Catholicism um, and evangelical Christianity, or even just the Protestant tradition, um, one uh, that you that the the saints are not a part of the Protestant tradition, and so uh, there is a real emphasis on the personal individual relationship um, with God, um, the ways that people um, pray to God tend to be a little bit different in terms of. Um, a greater focus on uh, the action, right, of, of basically a commitment to God um, prior to receiving anything. Uh, so people will talk about the purpose, right, that they have. And, and again, um, Brenda Jamal Thornton lays a lot of this out in his book, right, some of these differences. Um, but at the, uh, at the core in evangelical Christianity um, is the figure of Christ, and the idea that redemption comes only through him. Um, and so a lot of uh, churches will emphasize a switch in your, your culture, how you comport yourself uh, once you make that conversion, right? Uh, whether it be in some of the more strict churches, um, dressing differently, talking differently, who you hang out with, right? There's actually a visible change that's not across the board across all cultures, right? But it's it's particularly strong within the Dominican Republic that um, you see a visible change um, within a person's um, demeanor. It's really interesting. Um, I know I was reading a little bit about Brendan Jamal Thornton's work, and he also mentions that there is an emphasis in a culture of uplift and a culture of respectability for folks. You know, he did research in a marginalized neighborhood in the city of Santo Domingo. So he highlights how evangelical Christianity and this, again, this idea that you can shift your ways of being um, into a space of, you know, I would say, at least the word like respectability is the word that I would use. Um, and that has sort of offered a space to people who are at the margins of society to claim a level of um, respectability that they otherwise, or a social status that they otherwise would not be able to claim. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. my, my dissertation advisor, Helena Hansen, she just wrote a book, actually finished a book about um, evangelical Christian conversion in Puerto Rico in the context of addiction and how it creates like these evangelical clinics that are addiction treatment centers that create a space for people to enter into um, a way of a way of being that exonerates them or allows them to sort of um, step away from their past and like things that might have happened during their addiction. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting how religion ends up sort of tying together these sort of like cultural elements that are a little bit hard to put words into, right? You know, being you know, noticing or looking around and noticing like the DR is, you know, and I wish I could speak more about Haiti and the experience there. Um, but I noticed that um, because of marginalization, because of all kinds of forms of corruption, forms of poverty, um, anything that can give you an advantage in society will be, you know, will be a benefit to people. Mm -hmm. like, sort of social networks or patronage that can be strong and support you um, in getting a job or like enrolling your child in school or like, you know, any of these things that will support your livelihood are things that are gonna be, um, that are gonna be seen as positive, right? Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, you know, on the ICC page, we highlighted some examples of, you know, the evangelical church 
um, both in Haiti and the DR, you know, attacking people who identify as LGBTQ, right? So um, actively attacking that community and saying, you know, you know, when Willie, um, Wally Brewster was the uh, ambassador in the DR saying, hey, like, we don't want, you know, this is a Christian country. We're not a gay country, which I'm like, what's a gay country anyway, right? <laughs> I mean, come on. But, you know, other things like, you know, in Haiti, they, there was a law that was passed against gay marriage, even though nobody had been trying to get married, you know. I was on a bus this past weekend where, you know, I had a conversation with an evangelical preacher where I say, you can't or you should not um, proselytize against, you know, uh, like talking about ISIS and saying like ISIS is the enemy of Christians and therefore Muslims are the enemy of Christians. And I said, you know, all 1 billion Muslims are not part of ISIS. <laughs> they're not part of a terrorist organization and they're not all against um, Christianity, right? So how do we balance like, you know, the, the benefits of being part of these very strong social networks with the underside of the politics that are sometimes anti-pluralistic, and anti I would say even as far as saying like a little bit or a lot of it, but I would say anti-democratic in terms of like allowing space for everybody in society to operate. Right. So I would kind of balance that tension, you know? Yeah, I think that you've done a really great job of laying out some of the key tensions uh, and particularly the political tensions. One of the things that, um, one of the reasons why I think it's really important to do the history of uh, evangelicalism in the country um, and <laughs> the anthropology of in tandem um, is because there are multiple Christian traditions, right? Um, there are people who identify all kinds of ways um, and are still Christian. Um, and there are, are multiple theologies, right? Um, just because there are conservative politics that have co-opted or at least drive the narrative doesn't mean that there's not opportunity or history even, right, of other voices. Um, and I think it's a particularly important to bring those other voices to the fore um, because, uh, because there, um, there needs to be, in my opinion, a greater uh, theology coming from um, Dominicans of various, of various political uh, thoughts. Right. And so uh, while there is in terms of thinking about that um, in the Catholic Church, for example, um, we could think about uh, El Centro Bono, right, uh, who's done some great work uh, around uh, thinking about liberation and Christianity. Um, I think that there's opportunity there uh, for um, for that to happen on the evangelical side. There are also a great deal of structural structural barriers, um, including the current the current conservative politics, right, of evangelical groups, as well as uh, the influence of conservative evangelicals from the United States, which send a good deal of money into the island annually, um, and whose funds are tied to some of the most vocal groups on the island. Mm -hmm. And so um, one of the reasons why I highlight uh, the AME church is because that tradition um, has been a tradition which has protested throughout its history against uh, first slavery, then racism, right? And still today um, is a site um, working on behalf of the downtrodden. Uh, and it's not that other Christian churches don't, but the particular politics come out of a space of, of having been oppressed, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there is a lot more partnership to be done um, between Dominicans, um, evangelicals, right? Dominican evangelicals and people um, who are not necessarily the most conservative of American society, right? That's really interesting. And it actually gets at this last question that I, that I had that I asked you, you know, what do you see as the future of evangelical 
Christianity on the island? Um, yeah. So one of the things that I think has been particularly uh, neat or exciting within the last decade uh, or more is that there are more South-South, uh, if you want to use the, that language, uh, partnerships that are taking place. Um, it's not just U.S. partnerships, and I did mention the missionary funds that are coming in, but there are particular groups uh, that are Latin American evangelical groups, Central American and Caribbean evangelical groups. There's a partnership right now taking place between Korea and the Dominican Evangelical Church. And so I do think that there is um, a space uh, for people to really start thinking about Christianity from below. Um, and in that certainly you will continue to have conservative politics, but I also think that there is uh, there's space to think about, you know, liberation theology, right, which comes out of the tradition of the Catholic Church. How is that in uh, in conversation with Black liberation theology, which comes out of the African American tradition, right? Um, people have greater access to uh, resources, to internet, right? And so I, I I think that we'll see more of these conversations taking place, uh, more people beginning to critique. Um, their own beliefs and therefore open up new ways of really understanding uh, their relationship to God um, and how that could potentially, you know, spill over into society. Um, and so that that's what I think would be uh, what I see maybe for the future. And I'm excited to see, you know, what comes out of the Dominican Republic, what comes out of Haiti as evangelicals uh, continue to impact society. Awesome. Okay. Just two questions. This sure. one is so interesting. Okay. So Veronica Shetland asked, uh, she says, last question, smiley face. And I'm like, these are great questions. Thank you so much, Veronica. Um, so she says, in Haiti, the youth has been finding ways to keep their culture alive since evangelism has been shifting or erasing certain aspects of the culture that are intertwined with voodoo, whether it be through art, public programming, music, entrepreneurship, they're finding ways to keep their culture thriving. Are there similar parallels within DR? And if so, what are they? So essentially mm -hmm. parallels of keeping Afro-Dominican culture alive in the country. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that would be an amazing project <laughs> um, for somebody to go out and research. And I really hope that, um, I start getting graduate students uh, who would like to work on topics such as the such as these. Um, so in my research, I haven't quite studied that. Um, I would love to to know the answer to that question. What I have uh, done in my research is really look at the institution of the AME Church, and I keep saying the AME Church, but that's because that's where the bulk of my research has been. Um, and one of the things. Uh, in, on the Dominican side of the island, when people say AME Church, they typically think about Samana. Um, but I study the AME Church and its institutional impact, not just in the Samana Peninsula, but also in the southeast of the country. There's a, a church as well in Santiago. And so um, there's about 30 AME churches, and they maintain ties to um, the African Methodist Episcopal Church in the United States and to the AME Church in Jamaica and now most recently to uh, Brazil, right? And across the Caribbean. And so one of the things that people do uh, certainly to keep uh, their culture alive within the institution I study is through music, right? Um, it is through food cultures, right? And food ways. Um, and it's also maintaining a, a, just even these connections that they maintain themselves is a form of, if not pushing back against a uh, larger evangelical culture, holding on to something that uh, has been on the island for over 200 or for about 200 years, right? And so I assume and I believe that other people will do amazing work on parallels, right, to this going on within Dominican society. Very interesting. Thank you so much for your question. Yeah, that was really a great question. And Veronica, I actually would ask, I'd love to see if you could send a video to the ICC page um, that we can post and just share more about this information that you're sharing for us, um, the ways that youth in Haiti are keeping um, 
Voodoo Alive through like different art, public programming, music entrepreneurship. I'd love for you to just like share a little bit about that and we can actually make a post and like share it out with the audience. And that would be really, really neat. And like my final question, like as many people know, ICC's work is bridging the divide between Dominicans and Haitians. And so I have to end by asking, you know, do you see evangelical Christianity as actually bridging that divide that mm -hmm. has been constructed by the nation state that has sort of persisted um, over generations? Do you see the church being a space where some of those prejudices can be overcome? Uh, certainly, right. Um... <sighs> I think one of the things uh, that is hard and one of the things that we see not just uh, taking place right within evangelical culture, but across right Dominican society at large is that there's an official story, right? There's an official politics. Um, mm -hmm. And then people go off into their own little congregations and they do their own thing, <laughs> right? Um, and so definitely at the borders of society, we see partnerships uh, between Haitian congregations and Dominican congregations. I can't say that it happens all the time, but I know personally that I have been to um, at least one um, service where it was uh, Haitians, uh, Dominicans, and then the lone American me, <laughs> right? Um, all there together, right? And so I think that those sorts of things take place uh, on the daily. And I know that within my own ethnographic research, um, speaking with pastors in the AME tradition, that uh, that those partnerships are taking place. And uh, another, another example of that is within the AME church just this past, I'm gonna say, it was this year in March, the first um, Haitian, female Haitian minister um, was ordained in Samana, right, by the AME church. And this is within the AME tradition, right? Mm -hmm. And so those sorts of connections um, at that uh, service, right, there was Haitian music, Dominican music, Brazilian music playing, because there was Brazilian representation. Um, those sorts of spaces are really spaces of solidarity. Of course, there can be friction within spaces like this as well, but the overwhelming uh, sentiment is one of, of sharing, right? And I think that that's really important um, to keep those stories, those histories alive. Wow, this has been such a rich conversation. I feel like we just had a whole podcast. <laughs> uh, and I'm so grateful, Dr. Davidson, that you were able to join us because you really do have this really like wide ranging perspective. Uh, I confess that I came into this conversation feeling like, okay, like from what I know of today, like evangelical Christianity is, you know, really conservative and really kind of like anti a lot of what I believe, but I had no idea that there were actually other denominations or other histories, right? The fact that the first contact between Christianity and the island was actually with African American folks who wanted to um, come in and share their beliefs here. These are things that are like, I think are on, are, I didn't personally know. Um, and that gave me some hope, right? I think any space, like I really love the last example you shared about sort of the plurality of, you know, Dominicans and Haitians coming together in this AME church space and sharing culture, sharing their beliefs, right? Any space that can create openness between these two populations is really like a space that needs to be like thought about and considered. And, you know, despite what I thought at first about you know, the conservative nature of the church today, I feel like I've really learned a lot about, you know, just the different ways that it has unfolded. It's not just a single story. Yeah, and that's certainly true. I, I thank you and I thank ICC for the work that you're doing to really highlight some of those stories. Yeah, and Veronica has one last question. <laughs> it says, how can we contact you for further questions? Oh, uh, sure. Well, um, my professional email is on the Charles Warren Center's uh, website. Um, it's Christina underscore Davidson uh, at fas.harvard.edu. And I think that would be the best way to contact me. Uh, my website is also Christina cdavidson.com um, if you want to look up uh, more information about me or read my publications. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Thank okay. you checking out. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Saudi. Bye. Bye.